afternoon. We have a very distinguished panel in front of us for our final session today, but it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce our panel chair. As you all know, um, our industry is all about partnership, so it gives, it gives me, as I say, great pleasure to be able to introduce Ken Kiefer. Ken is the Director for Higher Education at Blackboard. Um, we are graduated as a Blackboard technology partner, so we're very proud to be able to have quite a few representatives from Blackboard in the audience with us today as well. Ken spearheads activities with the higher education sector. He is a market evangelist with a strong background in non-profit technology, currently serving also as Case Industry Advisory Council Chairman, and if I do say so myself, a great candidate for an honorary English gentleman. I give you Ken Kiefer. Wow. Well, I figured after um, Chris's wonderful panel um, chairmanship earlier, um, the only way to uh, create some uh, excitement and improve the, uh, the opportunity would be to recruit more people to the panel. <laughs> so, so Chris had four panelists. We started with five and now have six. So, uh, so Chris, you set a high bar. We'll try to do this as uh, eloquently and uh, informationally as we can. Robert, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. I need to know who your speechwriter is for that. I actually didn't write it. Um, although he probably found out that um, I stuffed the ballot box on a, uh, a vote. What he was uh, kind enough to allow me to share with the audience is that not only do we have a uh, global partnership with Graduate, but uh, earlier this year they were announced as Blackbaud's International Technology Partner of the Year. So uh, to the Graduate folks. Very well done. So uh, as I said, we have uh, six esteemed panelists. And um, I will run through and um, mention by name, but then have each of them um, provide a brief introduction of uh, who they're with, the uh, organizational profile, um, a little bit of background. But um, I will make a quick run through. We have uh, James Davis from University College London. Yeah, yeah. hello, everyone. I had to be coached on the pronunciation, but Carolyn Weber yes. <laughs> from the University of Amsterdam. Hello. Charles Hardy from LinkedIn. We have Eva Kubu. She's with Princeton University. We have Jeff Chance, who is from RPI back in the States as well. And Julia Sanchez with IE Business School. So I thought I would uh, sort of kick off with a, a couple of thoughts. Um, this is the uh, final session of the day. It has been a uh, very good day and a half of uh, colleague engagement, information sharing, and some fun along the way. So I thought I'd put together a few um, power words and phrases that I have come across while being here at GLS. The first one, Remembrance. The second one in our lead-off session, power word, maniacal. <laughs> we also heard about data-driven strategies, a, uh, a phrase that I think Chris, uh, is, if he did not coin, he will trademark soon, um, ROE, return on engagement. I like that quite well, ROE. I will probably use that again. And for those of you that were able to uh, join at dinner last night for uh, the uh, wonderful entertainment, we had um, the magician Alan Hudson who uh, utilized a Katie Price book, and those two power words were celebrity and glamorous. <laughs> the secret words. So we do have a celebrity-driven audience here, very proud to be um, part of this event, very excited to uh, support Graduate in this fashion. Um, what we wanted to do is um, really go straight into the content and dialogue. And um, unless Robert Caldwell, if you'd like to come join us here at the front and add to the panel, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> I should give him a shout out. He is also on the, uh, the case board that uh, I get to serve on. So uh, congratulations, Robert. Thank you for your stand in earlier. We'll give you two claps. So if we can uh, go straight into the, the questions, I think our, our first one is going to be read by uh, Abba Quarterly. She is the uh, 
uh, Senior Alumni Relations Officer at the Chevening Secretariat. How are your institutions going to adapt to meet the challenges and opportunity of a growing number of international alumni? Yeah, fantastic question. You know, we have uh, earlier, and I should have uh, mentioned this, that um, 20 countries were represented earlier when we did the uh, kind of parade of nations that uh, Daniel led us off on. That is uh, quite impressive. Um, I have not been before um, such a diverse, a geographically diverse and experience diverse group of people. So amazing, amazing work on that. Um, but with that question um, about the adaptation to an international alumni, um, James, if uh, you wouldn't mind offering your perspective to begin. Yeah, sure. Well, UCL has uh, got, what, over 200,000 alumni, um, and at least 85,000 of them are based in, what, 200 countries around the world. So we're well used to thinking around how do we engage with those alumni, how do we help them, how do we support them. Um, and we've got um, an also, awful lot of ambassadors all around the world who really think carefully about leading local activities, supporting student recruitment, um, mentoring, all the things that we've heard about throughout the day. Um, our big thing is prioritizing. Um, and increasingly UCL is thinking across the institution, what are our priority areas? Where do we need to really engage for our strategic aims as an institution? Um, and it's places like obviously the States, but it's China, um, and it's places like Hong Kong in particular. Um, and then also thinking more widely around um, what is the rest of the institution? How can the rest of the institution help us to engage some of those people? So what academic visits are taking place? Um, how can we partner with our international office? How can we partner with what's a brand new global engagement office? So UCL used to think about having overseas campuses. Um, it's now moving much more to a partnership model. Um, so what are the big institutions around the world that we can work with, that we can partner with? Um, and what are all the benefits that can come from, you know, maybe having an overseas office or two, which again UCL had a few years ago, and is again considering as a good way of energizing some of our local ambassadors. Um, so there's, it is about prioritization, it is about utilizing all the different staff. You know, UCL's got 10,000 staff, 37,000 students, a lot of international student societies as well. So it's thinking about all of the um, individuals who can help you engage your alumni um, and meet that challenge of all of the distinct um, alumni groupings you've got around the world. Oh, very good. Um, and being that you're probably in the most international city in the world, um, I'm curious just as a follow-up, is there um, a specific investment amount that you guys are making in some of these programs? Are you quanti quantifying um, either in we, people or, or dollars? Yeah, we're, we're very much thinking, um, you know, I work in a support engagement team that's part of a wider um, office that is alumni development. So we're thinking not only around how we're engaging people to get financial support, but we're also thinking about what money we're investing in building those relationships around the world. So we are increasingly thinking, well, you know, we're making some tough choices about where we're you know, investing our time, investing our money, um, and thinking about what's the philanthropic payoff, um, and what's the recruitment payoff for doing that. Very good, thank you. Uh, Carolyn, um, you, you're the uh, latest addition to the panel. The, um, uh, but representing uh, the University of Amsterdam, I'm curious if you would uh, share your thoughts um, now that you've had a, at least an hour to think about this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we are uh, beginning in the international, uh, uh, setting up international alumni chapters because in the past in the Netherlands it was not allowed to teach in English. We should, we, we had to teach in Dutch. But now uh, we can give programs in English as well, so that's a big difference. And I think at this moment, around 10% of our students are international, so internationalization is getting more and more important. And we started uh, building up alumni chapters abroad, and of course we looked at our neighbors through the, the case uh, system, and we set up alumni chapter run by alumni ambassadors. And we recruit these alumni ambassadors when they are students at the University of Amsterdam. We, we try to get, uh, we start first year, we invite them, we follow them during their years at the university so we can connect with them. And then at the end, we ask them if they want to become an alumni ambassador in their country. And last month, we had six international alumni events 
from Beijing, Shanghai, St. Petersburg, London, and New York, and a small one in Geneva as part of the Leary meeting. So it is really uh, working, and we can see it in recruitment figures as well, because it's much better to have your alumni standing there uh, when you have your recruitment days than just somebody from the uh, marketing uh, department. And was that the first time for each of those six events? Was uh, it the first no, no, time? No, 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 no. We, uh, I think in the last four years, we launched all the chapters. New York was an old chapter, but last year, the newest uh, chapter is London. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, I'll probably shift to this side. I have other questions for, uh, for LinkedIn that will uh, hold, unless you would... Uh... Sir, <laughs> I thought you said you were past. <laughs> um, Julia, I uh, wanted to uh, get your perspective, if we could, on that uh, same topic. Sure, absolutely. Uh, in our case, we have 50,000 alumni located across 160-plus countries. And so what we've seen for us, local know-how is key. Uh, for that, we have a very vast network of international offices. We have 27. Uh, seven of those offices actually focus on three core areas, which is recruiting, a careers, and B2B. And then for us, from the alumni office in Madrid, it's very important that we pursue a collaborative model with them. So we're very much in touch with our colleagues from the International Development, ne Development Network, and then also with our network of geographic clubs and, and the presidents of these clubs, and making sure that, uh, that we understand the local realities, uh, the different contexts that they're facing, um, how the alumni in those locations uh, interact with each other and also interact with us. Uh, of course, we see that some uh, communities are much more proactive and others are more reactive and they need more from our side to get them engaged. So this is where we really get uh, our know-how. Very good. Jeff, how does Rensselaer's programs uh, through international student, I'm sure that's a bigger recruitment strategy for you. Um, yeah, I mean, recruitment's important, um, especially in our, our graduate degree programs. I think that's vitally important. Looking out and figuring out how we're going to uh, build out alumni groups, though, I think knowing the culture is extremely important. Uh, that's the one thing that I think we found is we build out the programs to understand the culture comes first in a lot of these countries, especially as we're looking to Asia um, and India. As a matter of fact, in LinkedIn, and we actually have a uh, Mandarin uh, logo on the subgroup for our Chinese group and that that is uh, made them feel much more welcome So that helps us attract people to uh, Rensselaer and also uh, help us understand how to build programs for our alumni who are based there both uh, uh, Americans living abroad and, and those that are from there Very good Eva <laughs> So uh, I'm the lone career services representative <laughs> on the panel, so I can't necessarily speak to alumni relations per se, but I can give you some context uh, about Princeton in specific. We have about 12% of our undergraduate population that are international students, 43% of our population, uh, graduate student population are international, uh, largely from China, India, uh, the UK, Korea. Um, in fact, uh, we're looking at ways now to establish uh, alumni champions in each of these countries uh, globally that can help us um, connect students and alums with opportunities. Uh, one of the ways that we're doing this is through our various regional uh, and global hubs for alumni. We have clubs all over the world. Um, but in addition to that, across social channels. So just recently, uh, Princeton University became verified on the Weibo platform, which is one of the only social platforms in China. Um, so again, it's a way for us to connect in that space um, with, with alums and organizations um, that we can help, uh, you know, again, to connect with our students that will be returning to their home countries for opportunities. Very good. I'm interested, um, the term alumni champion is, uh, is, is um, sort of new terminology, um, at least to me, but the um, Specifically, is it, are you approaching that from a recruitment perspective in the way we've talked about mentorships in previous sessions? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so what we, what we see with respect to alums as champions in, in that role is really we're trying to build a community of advocates for Princeton students across the world. So that will include alumni who are champions, but in addition to that, um, parents, faculty, staff, and friends of Princeton who also sort of are more broadly representative of 
industries, perhaps, and uh, non-traditional careers that aren't necessarily inherent in our ecosystem today. Um, so we, we really want to reach out broadly. Uh, with respect to how that plays out, it could be you know, pounding the tables for opportunities within their specific organizations and bringing those opportunities back to campus. It could also be around mentoring and the way we see mentoring, um, and Robert, where are you? Because I'm going to use my, my term. Um, we, we see mentoring in more of a point mentoring um, you know, context so that it's not sort of these long, arranged marriages. Uh, Robert loved when I said that the other day on the phone. Um, it, it, it's something that we, we see that you know, alums can uh, connect with students, students can connect with alums, sort of a grab and go you know, basis where they can gather some information that's helpful um, across a wide range of connections and contacts rather than assigning them to one specific mentor. Um, and so that could be you know, in the form of advice, it could be uh, externships or shadowing opportunities at organizations to sort of give a, a student a perspective about a particular career path or an insider's look um, at a path they're considering pursuing but maybe don't really understand fully the realities of what it's like on the ground within that profession. So in a number of different ways. Very good, thank you. And, and Charles, um, to, to give you the floor, um, we'll reframe the question a bit since you don't have more okay. alums per se, but um, you know, how is LinkedIn viewing changes internationally and, and providing support um, or infrastructure in this area? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, LinkedIn, we get t-shirts for everything. Uh, I have a t, and we like to use the in as a pun too. So, in, in, in amazingly dramatic ways like international. Uh, <laughs> I have a t-shirt that says international on it because it, 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 it really is part of what we're trying to do. And the latest numbers, because so I'll, I'll throw some numbers out, 400 million members uh, on LinkedIn. We just hit two, two, men, two new members per second. Uh, and the growth truly is international. You know, it's slowed down in the States, um, slowed down in the UK because of the, the high penetration. But in South America, in the Middle East, in India, in China, uh, and the rest of uh, Southeast Asia, you know, just amazing growth. And you know, more and more uh, officers on the ground, people on the ground, uh, 25 languages. Uh, you may not know, you know, you can, on your university page on LinkedIn, you can have uh, the interface, your, your title, the welcome information in local languages uh, based on the person who comes to, that, to the page based on their own profile language settings. So you know, there's a lot there. And we have this vision of the economic graph uh, that we're looking to map the global workforce. Um, and so our CEO, Jeff Wiener, talks about 3.5 billion people. Uh, so apparently we've just got started. And we've got a long way to go. And, and, but as you can imagine, that needs really good investment and localization for markets like India and China, um, and particularly other, other you know, Southeast Asia countries, because they represent such a huge proportion of this global workforce uh, that we want to represent and want to provide this transparency of, of opportunity, of, of jobs and skills uh, and career development across the piece. So, you know, it, it truly is a mission for us. And I think in the past, uh, LinkedIn has been guilty of saying we're international because we've translated the interface of the page into a language, uh, which isn't necessarily being international or, or, or true localization. Uh, and in several countries now, we're actually doing it properly. Uh, and a lot more deeper engagement, thinking about cultural differences and, and behaviors and how people use our platform, not just translating uh, a few words into the local language. So there's a lot more going on there, there's a lot more emphasis on it, a lot more importance. Um, and I think you know, the upshot of that also is that we provide the data uh, that helps you engage more effectively and keep in touch with it, understand where people are within your alumni networks and you know, leverage that data effectively. It doesn't replace face-to-face -face engagement, and I totally echo the ambassadorial piece. You know, you want to, to activate these people, give them goals, make them feel involved, um, maybe even have rewards, you know, how they link into your international marketing, which is becoming more and more important, uh, talking to your marketing department, so how you bring in um, students and uh, postgraduates, particularly from abroad, uh, to come to your institutions. Uh, so yeah, I mean, international is absolutely huge for us. 
Very good, Charles. And, and I'm curious, um, you know, you, you see a lot of different um, institutional types across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, is there a um, particular institution that you've perhaps worked closely with that are really looking to leverage LinkedIn in a unique fashion to help with this internationalization of students? Yeah, I think the international part is probably driven by, by some of the business schools and rather naming them particularly. <laughs> I, I, that because of the nature uh, of what they're trying to do, they're trying to, to market internationally, they're more competitive in some of the people they're targeting to come and do these sort of qualifications further into their careers. Um, and that audience is on LinkedIn and we can offer a lot of insight. So they're the ones who are really tapping into that international flavor and probably have more international alumni networks as well, rather than the what I would term more undergraduate university mm -hmm. side, more the, more the business school side. Oh, very good. So I think this is an important topic to um, uh, get some input and feedback from the experts also in the room as well. And I'm curious if there's one or two individuals who would like to share a story um, from your respective institutions about how um, program change or investment is being driven uniquely to, to help prepare for the international, international student expansion. Again, Teresa Faulkner from Sauter School of Business at UBC. Um, just wanted to share, so for us, in terms of looking at international engagement, we're really looking at online and web-based engagement to address, faced with limited resources, uh, both human and financial, and therefore limiting the amount of time and, tra and places that we can travel to. Really, and this is not a plug, but looking at the graduate platform as a real key, uh, as a piece of, of that strategy, and how we can best leverage it and video technology and other such things um, to engage those people who live in cities that realistically we are never going to travel to and uh, never going to have that face to face. And so, how do we continue to add value in a way that they can still be connected to the network and, and still have a connection with the school? So, that's where we're focused on going forward. Oh, very good. Um, and I know you have a uh, very international base of students there at UBC and at the business school specifically. Are you seeing dynamic growth from any particular continent or region, or is it just a higher proportion of international students in general? China is our biggest, outside of Canada for sure, is our biggest market and biggest area of focus. So. That's, that's, where we're, that's where we travel to, but um, the US, I will say, is an area where we have growing numbers, um, but in some places doesn't make sense for us to travel, but obviously still very important and very successful grads there, so how do we keep them connected? Okay, very good, thank you. Any other thoughts or comments to share? I think just, just to reply to that, I, I think that's an, an interesting observation. In fact, um, one of the feedback points that I found very valuable in, in our travels as we go to these different locations around the world is that while online is important and very cost effective, it definitely shouldn't replace the face-to-face -face contact because the element of trust building there is so important. And oftentimes we talk about uh, how can we recognize the efforts of our volunteers and we think about small things such as maybe sending them merchandising or inviting them to one of our events. And really what I've come to realize is actually the, the act of getting on a plane and sitting across the table from them and having a conversation with them is huge in terms of recognition for them. So I just, I, I wanted to convey that because at least this has been a takeaway for us. Thank you, Julia. Um, our president is relatively new, seven years at Hopkins. Um, he's a young president, and he loves the young alums. So whenever he travels internationally, at first it was, oh, he wants to meet with a breakfast table of young alums. But now it's absolutely what we do. We know he's going to Israel, we're gonna schedule a, a breakfast table. We know he's going to South America, we're gonna schedule several breakfast tables. It's what he does. That in and of itself, that young connection has been, without a doubt, one of the best things for us to reach out into the international market. So is that creating um, more data analysis to look at um, sort of a percent, um, student percentages by, by country or locale to, to help support that and prioritize that for his schedule? Uh, yes, and it's creating everything. <laughs> Everything is, is ramped up as a result of that, okay. but um, the, 
the parent network has grown because of that, the young alumni, the um, incoming students, accepted students, will have a reception and we'll invite accepted students and suddenly that has a whole different meaning when the, the current president is there. But we take advantage, he loves the young, young students and the young alums, so we take advantage of it. Great story. Hi, I'm Christelle Cochetet from EDEC Business School. Uh, French business school are very international. Um, why? Because uh, since a uh, couple of years, we are uh, all the students study in English. Now, for example, for us, 44 percent of the students uh, find their first job outside their birth country. So that means that we have now 30. Uh, 7,000 um, alumni and students in uh, 124 countries. And we have uh, uh, 87 clubs um, of alumni all over the world. So that means these clubs are um, led by volunteers. And uh, what I want to share with you is two best practices. Uh, the first one is to have a, a kind of what I call shining events. Uh, branded events, so we organize, um, we push the volunteers ambassadors to organize welcome parties each year in September and October, and we send to the volunteer ambassadors the um, list of the newcomers, of the uh, students who are in exchange. For example, we speak, we have spoken about those can going to Canada, so they can the ambassadors feel very uh, proud of it because they can contact directly the students coming in, in exchange or those one coming in internship. So we have these welcome parties. Uh, so on the two last months, we have uh, organized 40 welcome parties, and in June we have a special big events. So I was uh, happy to hear about the figures. Uh, this morning, because for the uh, we have a, a special event. Its name is EDEC Rendezvous, so that means EDEC Big Meeting, and we have 40 cities organizing the same day this EDEC Rendezvous, and we uh, we have 1,500 participants. So relatively, uh, in comparison with the size of the network and what I have heard about these uh, reunions, where you have 450 people. I'm proud of my 100, uh, 500 people, uh, participants. So it's, um, it's a first uh, uh, best practice is maybe to have these branded events, welcome party and edit rendezvous. And the second one is when we have the admission team, when they go all over the world, they are, uh, organize each time a dinner with uh, alumni. Very good, thank you. I saw another hand pop up and then maybe that'll be the last one and then we'll Move to the next question. This is the question in which I reveal my ignorance, so forgive me, but I, I do believe in what you say, Julia, that our work, uh, alumni relations, it's a contact sport. Mm -hmm. And I get back to the first comments about uh, University College London about us needing to prioritize. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough resources to even attack my domestic constituency. Mm -hmm. And so as I think about going into one of our 50 countries, um, where, where does it matter most? Where is uh, the culture, um, where does it matter most of what culture to invest that face time versus other cultures? If you were to go into a, 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 assuming you have equal representation in all these countries, where do you spend your first dollar of resource? Does the question make sense? Great question, Robert. Uh, Jeff, did you want to offer some thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we, we dealt with this, you know, probably many years ago now, but I mean, when we started to figure out, all right, how are we gonna build our international program, we took stock on what we're doing domestically, what we're doing in the States, and finding ways that we can, little by little, start to move the needle internationally, and it had everything to do with communications. Um, you know, again, I'm just gonna say LinkedIn has been a, a real big part of that, because the groups meet on LinkedIn, our, our India group in particular, they all met on LinkedIn before we even had our first event. So, you know, the communication that was being fed out there, amongst other social media platforms. Um, but, um, but LinkedIn, you know, is a big part of it. And so I think, you know, if you do some of the communications piece and you do some of that initial work, you know, then you buy your airline ticket and you go out there once things are established. So that's just something, because we didn't have a lot of staff either uh, when we started. So I think it's perfectly manageable to do that. I think just adding to that as well, initially the way we started our network of offices was actually through volunteers. So our first offices were in Latin America. 
And once we saw that there was a critical mass, that there was a lot of activity and institutionally, then they started investing and actually building out offices. But initially it was sort of a grassroots effort. So I think that's a good way to start. Very good. Any other closing thoughts? I'd also, I'd also say it's so important to have good, and this is something we've struggled with over the years, to have really good volunteer materials and volunteer support materials for those particularly who don't get to go and see and visit very often. Um, they're very hard to keep fresh, very hard to keep flexible and mobile. Um, I'd also echo, you know, we've just had our president go to Hong Kong, do a young executives lunch. We've never done that before. Worked brilliantly well. Um, might be some future volunteers, might be some good fundraising leads, might be some good mentors. You know, actually getting to some of the younger alumni, um, because our Hong Kong club can, does have a tendency to be older. Um, so again, it's, we've moved our careers, professional development series, trialled one in Hong Kong recently again. You know, that's, it's taking it, giving it slight twists occasionally, um, but it is so important to work as an institution. And we have to, you know, I've got five on my team, we have one, up to recently, one person doing all the international work. So you've got to prioritise it, and it's got to fit with the institu institutional priorities. Thank you, James. Well, I think in the interest of time, we'll uh, close out on that topic. And um, we want to discuss um, a, uh, an area, careers and mentoring, where we um, began yesterday talking about roadmap as well as a, a case study from UCLA. So we have a, uh, a question that will be uh, read by Phil Brazell, who is the uh, Director of Careers and Calling at Azusa Pacific University. And I didn't write this question, but it sounds like maybe it came from your conversation. But it says, will mentoring programs of the future look more like a dating app than an arranged marriage? And could alumni career services become the new focus of our function? Very good. I could probably go in multiple directions on this. Um, Ava, you, uh, you were describing your expertise. I think this might be a good one to start on. Uh, we were like-minded. <laughs> um, so first let me give a little framing around uh, what's happening at, at Princeton. Um, so right now we're uh, leading a strategic reinvention of career services, uh, largely in response to uh, sort of the national dialogue in the U.S. around the return on investment for higher education as well as accountability expectations around higher education and alumni feedback over a number of years as well as generational shifts, much uh, like Elizabeth's talk earlier today about the, the kind of the shift with respect to millennials and different generations and what their expectations are of uh, their university experience as well as career expectations. And then changes, of course, across the entire employment landscape. So a lot of this right now is pointing us to the direction of, again, creating an army of advocates within the alumni space um, in mentoring, in some mentoring capacity City. Um, what we see is, again, the value is, is in point mentorship, um, but we also see that we want to create a community uh, online, um, to, so also to facilitate globally these connections, um, but in ways that are really sort of natural and organic. So across the dimensions that are, are really sort of contextual, shared interests, shared affiliations, and shared intent in connecting. Um, so what we are, are working on right now, and, and some of my conversations with Graduate uh, of late, have been around ways that we could look at a platform like Graduate or others um, to, to really activate this, this network online in a way that uh, we can intuit matches between students and alumni, and alumni and alumni across these different dimensions. One of the things that we see in the space right now is that many of the fields that you will see on, on an alumni directory or other mentoring platforms really don't drive or, or really get at the core of what drives connection in, in, in terms of uh, people's interests and their passions, right? So if you, for instance, <coughs> looked me up in my alumni directory, you would see that I have 20 years of experience in career services and a communications and marketing background and likely reach out to me for advice about careers in that space. 
However, that's not really what I'm most passionate about talking to others about. I'm really passionate about social media and the intersection of technology um, with respect to driving connections. I'm also very, very passionate about helping low socioeconomic students and first generation students because that's my profile. Um, and so that wouldn't come alive in a platform, right? Um, right now based on the, the fields that exist today. So what we're working with um, you know, a, a number of vendors on is really sort of developing this more contextual database that would, again, get to really the things that truly matter to individuals because I think that's where they'll invest their time, talent, treasure, and to your point earlier, Robert, tribe, right? That's where they'll, they'll invest that, that time. So with respect to mentoring, what you would see is, you know, maybe a student that's truly passionate about you know, education reform or something like that. And they, they could see then that across the alumni landscape or perhaps students, uh, I'm sorry, staff and faculty and parents where others have that same passion um, and really make those connections that are meaningful um, and authentic um, rather than sort of these artificially and again sort of arranged marriages that exist, you know, I think in the mentoring space right now. Yeah, I would like, I'd like to follow up on that just from the perspective of contextual data and information, um, you know, to create these natural and organic um, intersections. Um, great vision and approach. Curious from a data management perspective, are you having to create new fields, new storage areas? Is that part of the thinking and process? Yeah, and again, we're right now in the discovery process. Yep. We're talking to a lot of different vendors to see what exists across mm -hmm. the landscape. You know, we're also exploring whether in-house development is something that we'd want to pursue, although getting the sense that that might be a, a little burdensome right now. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, those those fields or those dimensions would, would absolutely be part of maybe some of the information that exists in our system of record mm -hmm. um, within our alumni association, within our development platform right now. But it's not information necessarily um, that our alums are sharing you know, uh, mm -hmm. with us in career services. So we'd like to have a system in place where it's sort of a single sign-on. It exists within you know, our, our alumni platform in some way um, or our alumni directory in some way. Uh, make it really simple and easy, populate or pre-populate as much information as we possibly can. Um, that makes sense. Obviously, lots of governance and control around you know, certain types of information. Um, but then also allow alums to go on the platform and express you know, for themselves what they are truly most passionate about connecting with others on. Very good, thank you. Um, Julia, obviously the uh, business school community, it's, it's a very important topic. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. So. Uh, I used to, for the past four and a half years before I was in this role, I was managing our flagship program, the International MBA, and every time I would go into the classrooms, the question I would get is, you know, where are our alumni and what are they doing? And so we always, we always talk about numbers, 50,000, but who are they? So we came up with this idea to create an app that would allow our alumni to access the network beyond their classes and beyond their programs. And so we call it the iAlumni app. And uh, basically, it has a geo uh, location functionality. So no matter where you travel in the world, you can actually turn this on. It'll recommend people within uh, a radius uh, that you can connect to. And it's non-intrusive because you can decide whether or not you're interested in connecting. And if you do make a match, you can chat with them in real time. And so this is something that we just rolled out a couple weeks ago. We see that the alumni community, they are excited about this. Um, it does have a bit of this matchmaking, but from a professional standpoint, uh, functionality. But essentially, it takes us out as a middleman, and I think it allows those who are, are proactive enough, and, and this is something that we're trying to educate the alumni in, to really connect and to have those meaningful conversations. So this is something that we're, we're quite excited about, and we want to see how, uh, how it plays out over the next months. Jeff, uh, having sort of an engineering-oriented institution, you probably also have some important mentoring programs in place. Thoughts on how the matching occurs? Well, our, our mentoring programs have not been as successful as we would have liked them to be. Either the students don't respond favorably or our alums um, just opt not to do that. So some of our electronic type uh, functions have helped particularly well. Uh, not all engineers are exactly uh, sociable in the ways that we would, uh, we would wish them to be. Um, and I'm glad this is taped. 
Um, but, but, it, but it is important, I think, to have a, a digital solution to some of this stuff because our, our students do feel more comfortable interacting with partners, mentors um, online and doing it in a way that, that is uh, convenient to them. Back to some of the, the conversations about the millennials and the Gen Xers, I, I think you know, having a place that's convenient where they can meet on their time I think is really important. Um, and the truth is, is a lot of our engineers are developing these apps too. So there's another angle to this whole piece as well. Very good, thank you. Yeah. I'll go in this direction now. Um, James, any additional thoughts that you'd like to add around Yeah, mentoring? sure. I mean, again, all the online mentoring um, is brilliant and enables, again, to us to connect a lot of our international alumni in brilliant ways. We've also run a UCL Connect professional development series for about the last four or five years. Um, so that is speed networking, that's workshops, that's online videos, that's panel discussions, and we've targeted at those who are like 10, up to 10 years from graduation. And that's proved to be tremendously successful at really um, engaging a group who we were struggling with often um, to get in to, to engage with us. Um, and it's nice to see this, a lot of the same faces coming back, whether it's a panel discussion on careers in journalism or how to get a first novel published or something completely different around engineering or similar. So um, I think there's a tremendous amount of mileage in having a lot of that face to face, again that human interaction um, in addition to all of the online mentoring um, that's out there. Very good. Sure. Yes, well, as, uh, we in the university doesn't have the staff to do the uh, personal mentoring. I mean, why, we have two people in a career office, and so you, you are really depending on uh, digital tools to help you. And uh, that doesn't mean that you don't need personal touch, because I think that will be important, but you could never be the arranged marriage where you were talking about, well, forget it, because you won't have the people to do it. And especially, I think, with the international community, the LinkedIn is helping to connect them. Mm -hmm. And they, I, I, we, for example, we have in Shanghai uh, alumni group from the original alumni group, only from lawyers, who will meet every month and talk with each other. And being like a, a mentor group for each other, well, it's very good. And they organized it themselves through the alumni chapter. Yeah, very good. And uh, of course, we, uh, we have to have this uh, question responded to by the 400 million uh, registered uh, dating app site, uh, LinkedIn. W would you be willing to share your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a very obvious answer that we're here to facilitate that and provide direct access. But at the same time, you know, while there's people who are going to take advantage of that, proactive people, you know, people we've referred to there, and you don't necessarily have the resources to, to manage every marriage, I think there's a danger of taking technology as the answer. And it's not necessarily the answer, it's a great enabler. Mm -hmm. uh, but people are very different, and some people will want help, and won't just want to be put in a virtual room together uh, with someone they don't know. And then there's the other piece here, which is what I love James is saying about professional development, is um, you need the skills to do this right. Uh, when, when I talk to, to students and career services, around using LinkedIn and networking and engaging with people. I use the term netiquette. Uh, but it's all around using you know, these tools well. And do people have the skills to start talking to someone they don't know? Both, both ways. You know, the skills to mentor, the skills to engage someone, to ask them to mentor and talk in the right way. And I think uh, you know, we talk about the development here uh, of the function. You know, if you can step back a little bit and allow some people to do this by themselves because they, they have the confidence or the capability, but there's going to be a lot of people who, how can we provide, you know, some coaching uh, and skills to do that, you know, both for students, both for alumni, you know, who are looking for that. What resources, what coaching can you provide, whether that's in-house or, you know, here's a plug for Linda that we just bought, you know, there's, there's uh, online learning that you can direct to, then great. Uh, but, you know, as I say, I'd see LinkedIn and other tools as a great enabler, but there's the people aspect here too. Yeah, so it certainly seems as if um, the consensus, did I? Oh. I just wanted to add something to what um, Charles just mentioned. Really, it is about that combination of high tech and high touch. And, mm -hmm. and one of the themes, you know, I, I really feel very honored that I was part of this conference because I've learned so much about our good colleagues and alumni relations uh, with respect to 
the ways that some of you are, are partnering or may not be partnering with the Career Center. Um, and, and in this you know, regard, I think with the high touch, you know, being there, you know, having career counseling um, and programming, I mean, we offer in our Career Center over 300 workshops, panels, and programs a year um, that include over 400 alumni as panelists and guest speakers. And this, this, in this way, that's that sort of high touch you know, aspect where you can get that face-to-face -face time and really, um, you know, understand uh, an alum's story, you know, their their career journey, and and allow alums and students to really connect with that. Um, but then also having that resourcing available online to either facilitate an initial conversation or an extension of conversations that might have occurred on campus, right? Um, and so I do see it, it absolutely is not a one or another. It absolutely has to be a combination. Yeah, or, or you know, and, or a short video that shows some mentors talking about getting into it. What are the key things? How to sort of kick it off, you know, to give people confidence that they can go and do that themselves. I think, you know, which doesn't have to be high touch. It's yeah. just providing things that will help it go smoothly and successfully. No, very, very good thoughts. Thank you for the addition, Eva. Um, I think there was a very consistent um, perspective that uh, there is uh, the arranged marriage route really isn't the appropriate way. There are some uh, varying degrees of sophistication in how data is being captured and thought about and stored, but clearly an opportunity for platforms like Glad Graduate to help in the capture of that. And then data storage, mining, and then presumably analysis will come out of, of this as well, I have to imagine. Very good. Well, let's, um, let's move to uh, question three. Uh, this is uh, the topic of value proposition. And uh, for question three, we are going to have Jeanette Hepburn, who is the Executive Director of Development and Alumni Relations at Smith School of Business, Queen's University, Ontario. Made it easy for you. <laughs> So, what value proposition does the panel believe we will need to offer our alumni of the future to engage them? Seems to be a, uh, a continuing theme about uh, value proposition, measurements, and KPIs, but obviously a very important one, particularly to the, uh, to the alumni community. Um, we didn't really sequence uh, an order for this. Um, so I'm looking to see who would be most attentive. Julie's looking down. I'm happy to give my thoughts on that. No, no. <laughs> He's just looking directly at me. <laughs> Being put on the spot. I'm happy to start. <laughs> I volunteer. You have the, you have volunteer. the floor. <laughs> I'm right behind uh, you. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks for the support. Um, from our perspective, I think that the value that we can add is to have an increasingly customer-centric approach. Uh, so clearly, a, a one-size-fits-all uh, model doesn't work, especially when we have alumni uh, across the globe. Uh, some examples of how we're doing that, for instance, is uh, historically, or speaking about careers, we used to have an annual career fair based in Madrid. And um, so we've learned over the course of the years that um, this doesn't uh, add enough value. Of course, uh, the career fair in Madrid is excellent for students on campus, but how about our alumni who then go back to their own countries and are looking to advance? And so now we're doing uh, regional career fairs in different parts of the world, and this has uh, worked very, very well. Uh, in terms of the app that I mentioned before, uh, this would be one channel to be able to connect amongst alumni, but then uh, going to, to a more personalized approach, we have very senior alumni that are looking to us for that personal match. Somebody, for instance, in Dubai that wants to do business in the U.S. is coming to the alumni department and saying, who can you connect me with that's also perhaps at my level of seniority to do business? And so this is where I do think that we add value and we can intervene again as, as a middleman. So I think it's always it's sort of moving in between those two roles where we step away as a middleman and then step back in depending on the situation. Yeah, I mean, look, back in the beginning of uh, the beginning of time for our alumni offices, we knew what year they graduated, we knew what degree they got, and where they went to live, right? So what did we do? We we built reunion programs, and we have regional chapters, you know. And so all this has sort of evolved based on the data that we've been able to collect. And so as we segment this all out, the value proposition now is going to where they are, 
Uh, affinity groups are inc incredibly important. We've been doing those for many, many years. Special interest groups. I love the idea of passion and profession. That, that is something I'll, I'll take from this conference. Shared interest groups, I think, are incredibly important. And then the other big thing for us from a value proposition standpoint, uh, our, our new president of the Alumni Association actually just launched uh, what she feels is the greatest value proposition is career services, is how we're going to help them both career and professional development and making sure that those two are connected as we go through and as we build our platforms. It's not just about getting a job, it's about going out and meeting new people, um, engaging our alums where they are, having welcome receptions when our new classes get there, and making sure they understand that there is a global network that is there for them. And you know, again, it can be interactively, but it also, um, I personally think the face-to-face -face, um, interaction in our clubs and chapters are um, incredibly important. And so you know, we started the day talking about where does the university sort of fit into this. And if, the, if dad is not it, I still believe that they want to come together under this common bond that they had when they were back on campus. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the value proposition. Yeah, and um, probably a very good transition since you called out the career services component uh, for Eva's thoughts. And, and I'm maybe even a more granular level, um, how does the partnership work with alumni that you, yeah. know, you sit down and, and do today to, to help in the overall strategic engagement? So I'll, I'll just go back to just piggybacking on what Julia mentioned. Um, I, I do see that the value proposition is personalization, and I also believe that that begins when they are students, uh, right at the beginning of their experience. Um, the more you can tailor, um, well, first off, the more you can understand students' interests as they evolve and change over the course of four years, and really sort of tailor uh, the advice that you give and the guidance that you offer through career services to those students, the more in the long term they will attribute their career decisions and much of their success um, in terms of their lifelong career management to your institution. Um, and that, I do believe, is, is a huge value proposition for any, any institution. Um, when they can attribute their success um, and feel that they were supported and are continuing to be supported throughout their lifetime in their career management, that, that is something that absolutely will drive affinity and engagement. Um, so from the career services perspective, um, the way we partner now, and, and as I mentioned, at Princeton, we are currently reinventing our model, and it is much more focused on alumni engagement than it ever was in the past. Um, so in, in, we're, we're tackling this in two respects. With res, uh, the way we are reorganizing career services, we now have an assistant director for student alumni engagement who partners very closely with the Alumni Association um, on events, um, and, 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 some, and in some ways, in um, sort of leveraging what are the traditional um, sort of alumni events that exist uh, in, in Cursor, uh, I'm sorry, in, at Princeton, but in a way that they have now a more career-oriented stamp on them. So for instance, there's a tradition at Princeton that every class is assigned a grandparent, parent, and sibling class. Um, wouldn't it be brilliant to be able to have sort of cross-generational mentoring? So an alum who is in that grandparent class that has the wisdom of years and a lifetime of a career uh, path and journey. Also a mid-career um, parent uh, you know, uh, class member. Also a sibling, someone who's young, right, taking their first steps in a career, maybe onboarding to a new industry for the first time. The wisdom of sort of that combination you know, of, of advice from these individuals would be so powerful, I think, in, in the lives of our students. So leveraging things that already exist within uh, your institution, um, you know, maybe some of these legacy programs, maybe some of these traditional um, you know, programs that might be offered. And then we also feel very strongly that we shouldn't offer necessarily these big, large-scale, impersonal recruiting events. So we, we changed our, our career fair model, for instance, and we've moved away from uh, the large go into the gym and everyone's vying for a position with 500 different organizations, and you know, it, it's really about having that, that face time with the recruiter. Um, we flipped the model a little bit, and now we are offering um, niche meetups by industry 
sector, where we are actually handpicking and inviting the organizations based on our understanding of where our students <laughs> lie. The organizations, they're telling us they would like to see. So we're more proactive about the outreach rather than just sort of a blanket invitation uh, to every recruiting organization to come to our, our fair. Um, we also see that the, the students are able to have more meaningful dialogue because we're now also inviting <coughs> alumni representatives from each of those organizations to stand side by side with their HR partners or their campus relations people um, and offer that unique perspective of what, you know, what it was like for them at Princeton, what led them to that organization, you know, those more meaningful career exploration conversations rather than sort of that pitch and sell environment um, that, that most career fairs feel like, and, and that's so intimidating to a student. We also hear from the alums that they absolutely love coming back mm -hmm. for those events. We also see that a number of alums that are re-careering or transitioning love coming back for those events. So, you know, also offering support, you know, obviously we want to make sure that we're there uh, to support our alums throughout their lifetime when they are re-careering. Um, and we see, you know, anywhere from 1,500 to 1,700 alums annually coming through the Career Center for that level of support. And we absolutely want to be there for them because we are looking to partner with them, you know, uh, in, in these ways, you know, that we're supporting our students. We absolutely need to reciprocate and be there for them when they need us. Very good. Thank you. So Charles, we, uh, we've acknowledged that uh, LinkedIn has a very important role as it relates to being where alums are today, uh, certainly from a uh, uh, professional uh, development or career service perspective. Um, you know, curious from LinkedIn's thinkings, how do um, you know how do you view mentorship? Are there any sharings that you have from a LinkedIn um, longer range planning perspective? Yeah, I, you know, I think in in terms of bringing those together, it's really the origin of some of the tools that we've developed. You know, the alumni tool is providing that transparency of career path uh, of your of your graduates of your alumni and where they go and. You know, that, that's, it's such a great tool for, for career services, but also is feeding back into the brand of attraction. Um, so, you know, in terms, of, in terms of that piece, I think there's, there's value throughout the chain. And also to those employers of those alumni, mm -hmm. because talking to the employers on the flip side of the coin, the realization that there's now transparency over who works at their company and a student, um, will look at people who've gone to work at these companies and look at their profiles, so they are brand ambassadors and representing what it's like to work there. You know, from a series of employee photos that all look like this. <laughs> First impression, do you want to work there? Are they talking about their career development? So there's a real piece that actually is for the employers to leverage to make sure that these people have good profiles because they're part of now their recruitment and their own branding and attraction, as well as, of course, their business engagement. And, you know, people want to work with the right people. Uh, so that element needs to be weaved in. I mean, I just wanted to, you know, this question around the value proposition, we talked about a few things throughout the day that, that resonate with me. And sometimes I sort of sat there listening and, and put on my alumni hat as, a, as an alumni of a university and thinking, well, what do I get from my, and you can look me up and see where I went. But, you know, I, I get some great communications, but does it necessarily resonate with what I came from? There was a great uh, talk here last year by, by Penn, I think it was, talking about that early engagement, even before people had started the university and they were being, you know, tapped up by the alumni and having that emotional connection. Uh, and. and you know, I played a lot of sport at university. Um, here in the UK, university sport it just doesn't exist once you've left. You can't find out any information very easily. It's not like in the States where it's very, very, uh, very strong in the media. Uh, but I'm thinking, well, if they customized that, I'd probably be more engaged. Um, but I wonder, you know, do, if you think about your alumni and, and, and all this give back, and it could be, you know, we heard about those T's earlier, and it's, it's talent as well as treasure and things like that. But you know, can they be, feel like shareholders in the university? Do they feel like they have a voice? You know, it might not be making huge decisions, but you know, can you involve them in some of the things that are happening with the university to give them a voice? I know we, we touched on focus groups earlier um, and, and surveys, but 
you know, things like that that can, can, can really, you know, if you're changing your logo, would you put it out there to let them have some kind of feedback on something like that? Um, I saw one university recently change their logo. They updated it on LinkedIn, and boy, was there a lot of feedback on, on that. It was <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, probably the biggest response rate uh, that, that they've had on some of the posts. You know, things like that do get a reaction, and I think if you have that involvement in just an ongoing basis that you feel that you're part of that, as I say, like, like a shareholder. Um, do you allow referrals from alumni? So I was talking to a university yesterday that have 90,000 students and alumni on LinkedIn, and we're looking at that. And then, you know, and they have 5,000 employees, plus some, some additional followers, and you think, wow, 90,000 alumni that you could activate to help find people. You know, and they're gonna have some involvement in your brand, some buy-in. They could be actually alumni who could do those jobs, or they might know people and refer them. Would you reward them for that? Would you possibly give them a buy? I don't know if anyone does that kind of thing. But it's starting to, as I say, just involve them in that, and would you give them recognition for being ambassadors? Can they, I talk to students a lot, and their you know, certification badging is very popular, so would you award badges as a, you know, different levels, you know, platinum alumni? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I quite like the sound of it. Uh, I might be talking to my university. Um, so it's just things about, you know, make them feel special and involved, I think, as part of that. Give them a voice and, and, and not just that. I, I think there is a mentality within alumni that you are just tapped up for money. Well, certainly uh, traveling in the way that uh, several of us do loyalty programs through Delta or United or, yeah. or the hotel chains uh, certainly create loyalty and interest, and I do pay attention to those well, things, I mean, so it, it applies in a similar fashion. Yeah, right? and, and uh, you know, I'm thinking of Groupon. Can you, <laughs> can you offer things like that to them, that, 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 that there's a buying power or part of this community is really going to give them value, that they can get things through being part of that? Yeah, very good. Um, so, Carolyn and James, are there some um, additional thoughts on value proposition around future engage engagement you'd like to share? I would like to share that I think it will be a challenge to find things for the generation uh, X and Y to get them involved because they are far, far more self-centered than the other generations you're handling. So it will be hard to, to appreciate them because as I'm used to the older generation, when you say thank you and you invite them, they are honored. But if you ask a younger person, well, do you really need me? Uh, do you, what do you want me to do? No, I don't think I have time. That's a normal reaction. And I think that will be the challenge to get the younger generation in your programs. Well, I think uh, Elizabeth's research earlier showed that they actually liked uh, receiving personal uh, letters on that day. <laughs> that was amazing for me <laughs> because I, I noticed my children who are in uh, almost 30 years, they don't read their mail at all. James, Snail mail. <laughs> I would just I'd echo everything about it being a lifelong relationship. Um, and it's very much about what you can offer as being there for all those different life stages, whether it's when they're applying to be a student, whether it's graduation, whether it's helping them in those transient years following graduation, whether it's when they're retired. It's tailored programs and it's being there. Also, you're the gatekeepers to this wonderful um, intellectual capital that the institutions have. So, you know, you know what's coming up. You know what might be the big stories. You're, you've still got some of that um, exclusive inside knowledge um, that you can involve alumni with or give them opportunities to become more involved with. Very good. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to uh, um, the, the next discussion area in the um, topic of, of professional. This is a bit of a provocative question, I believe. Might have some uh, polarizing responses, but um, uh, this will be read by uh, Laura Wayland, the Executive Director of Alumni Relations at Northwestern University. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, has alumni relations lost the argument that dollars raised are more important than relationships gained? <laughs> now I have to see who... Uh, <laughs> I'll take is, there, is there clinching going on? Go ahead, Jeff. 
I, it's just such, such a ridiculous question. I, no offense, because I know you didn't write it, but uh, I mean it in a way that, um, you know, I often thought if development officers talked as much about us as we talk about development, I mean, it, we really have to kind of get over this whole thing that there's this us and them thing going on. Uh, there really isn't. As a matter of fact, um, you know, even my most esteemed colleagues over here um, in the front row would admit that our development offices are some of our biggest advocates in a lot of ways. And so I think absolutely not. I don't think we've lost the argument that dollars raised are more important. I think engagement and all the things that we do lead to investment. It may not be the, old, the, the end goal, but it absolutely leads to investment. Our alumni office has been part of some of the largest gifts ever received at our university, as is many of yours as well. Um, but we're also building career programs, admissions efforts. I mean, we are the great enabling organization. And so, you know, if we have lost that argument, perhaps we've won many other arguments in the sense that we are enabling our universities to continue in perpetuity, which is the whole point. So, um, so yeah, provocative question, but I think uh, the answer is no. So, so let's um, reframe, perhaps. Um, I would suspect that there's a common belief by most of the uh, uh, alumni representatives on the panel and in the room. Um, how are we seeing, um, are there other examples perhaps of how um, there is more coordination? And we've, I know we've heard several stories in other previous panel areas, but if you could think of a specific example that might relate to how um, you are working with your development colleagues in a fashion to help bring balance in the broader strategy and things that we heard about Oxford doing as part of the bigger picture. James? Yeah, we run a philanthropy month every February. Um, I say we, sounds like we can do it in a number of years. We did it last year. Um, <laughs> so, and we have, a, you might have heard of the philosopher Jeremy Bentham, whose body sits in our cloisters in the center of the university. UCL is full of all sorts of different mixture of institutions, all sorts of mixtures of affinity. You know, they're quite a radical alumni body. They don't like to be herded in one direction or another direction. Um, so, we were thinking, well, how do we really start to talk about philanthropy in the widest sense? So, not just the money, but also the volunteering side, opening up networks, expertise, and all the rest of it. So, we thought, we've really got to start with the students, really got to make sure they understand the value of all the different aspects of philanthropy. So, we developed, we had lots of Jeremy Bentham face masks, and tried to do a world record attempt of everyone wearing a Jeremy Bentham face mask, stood in front of our big portico. Um, people took the face masks around the world, posted it all on social media. But what was really good was we were working on, and we involved a lot of our international groups as well in the, in the activity, but we're working with our development colleagues to really articulate both sides. You know, it's all about volunteering, but it's also all about raising the money, and the two are intertwined. Um, and we're launching a big philanthropic campaign next year, but again, it's, it's two strand. You know, it's the supporter engagement strand. Um, who are engaging around some of our, you know, key volunteers, some of our celebrity alumni. We're very fortunate at UCL with who we've got and who we want to involve. Um, but also, clearly, it's about raising many, many millions for some key projects. So we've recently looked at some of our top 300 celebrity and notable influential alumni um, and are thinking about how are we working with them to win an internal um, PR exercise around what's, what's the value of alumni relations? Because if you are able to put up a very notable or influential former student who might be supporting a new campus, might be supporting a student recruitment initiative or similar, that does get you a lot of internal buy-in. Um, so we're thinking about, okay, what, you know, with this notable alumni or that, what's the strategic objective, developing engagement plans for them, and thinking very carefully around how we can engage them, but are using our development college ex colleagues' expertise to help us formulate those engagement plans. Um, and, you know, there'll be fundraising opportunities for those individuals as well as engagement opportunities. So, James, I want to follow up on that a little bit. So, you'd mentioned engagement plans. So, th there is a broader stewardship plan that you guys are putting forward that may have not only an engagement po component, but a more development-specific component. You guys That's right. That. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's just about us, again, being, being very careful around, yes, we have many volunteers and many volunteer hours, but we're also quite realistic internally that if we're at a reception or an event, 
and we can engage a, an influential former student in a particular project, like we're having a new um, campus at the Olympic Park, then that's a really powerful voice on a committee, or it might get us some media profile. Um, so it's, it's about you know, making sure that there's two sides to the philanthropic coin. Yeah, very good. And, and what other strategic initiatives, um, I'll, I'll go kind of across the entire panel, is there a particular story um, or experience at your institution that aligns the strategy of, of alumni with development that, in the manner that we've described? And right now we're at the very beginning stages mm -hmm. of our development efforts, but we are working very closely with our colleagues across the network of schools and um, specifically they're helping us to generate leads but um, going back to I think some of the discussions we had earlier we firmly believe that our responsibility is to create a suite of services and products that are attractive to our alumni and hopefully if we're doing a good job there then the development efforts will go hand in hand so this is this is what we're trying to, to implement right now working very closely with the uh, Alumni Association and development um, to cultivate relationships with alumni. Um, in, in particular, development will often... <laughs> um, but, um, so development will often reach out. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> name that too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the two-minute warning bell that perhaps uh, <laughs> it's the band warming up to uh, get the award ceremony to move along. <laughs> um, so our colleagues in, in development will often reach out to uh, me to say that they're working with an alum right now who is interested in becoming a donor, um, but also wants to help in general. Um, so we make sure that there are opportunities for either you know, a guest speaker arrangement or having them come back and participate in a panel or some, in some way to help them to connect with students because they're not just interested. What, what we're seeing is they're not just interested in making that donation. They really want to be part of what's happening on your campus. So when they reach out and say, this particular alum has a passion for green careers, we'll say, that's fantastic. I'd love to invite them to campus. Let's work together and create either an event or an opportunity for them to come and speak or share their expertise in some way. And so I think that's a win-win. They, they absolutely will be more inclined, um, I think, to donate um, as well as you know, donate their, their time and their, their talent. Very good. I think that sense of community is really important because I think a lot of, uh, even some of the biggest donors like to feel part of a wider community. It's often said to us, it's like, fine, I'm treated in a particular way, I build a close relationship with me, but I still want to feel part of the wider network. Oh, very good. So I learned once upon a time that you can uh, never stand between people's uh, travel schedules or happy hour. <laughs> So I am going to call a small audible and we'll actually go to the last question to try to be respectful of everyone's time. So uh, apologies to uh, Helen Geary who was supposed to be the reader of uh, question five, but we will go to um, a question on major change. And I think this is really looking out in the future, um, projecting forward. So this question will be read by Paul Williams, uh, Director of Operations at uh, London Business School. Paul, are you still? Thank you. Um, I've just been promoted, so thanks for that. Um, so at GLS in 2030, what does the panel think will be the most significant difference from today in the world of alumni relations? So 2030, that's 15 years from now. That's a lot of crystal ball thinking for everyone. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I recently read a, uh, a letter from an alum from the class of 86, and he was lamenting that it was so hard to find his graduates, his classmates, and he tried the post, the mail, he tried um, you know, meeting with the postmaster, he called uh, you know, on friends and family, he sent telegrams, and I'll divulge now, it was a letter from the class of 1886 at Rensselaer. And the thing that struck me is we are gonna be dealing with some of the same problems 30 years from today. It's gonna be about information, data, finding friends. Here's this graduate in the class of 1886, lamenting on how come his reunion wasn't as successful because he couldn't reach everyone. That's the problem we had last year. 
Um, so, you know, I, I'll just be the one that kind of posits that some of this stuff is human nature and we're dealing with human beings and, uh, and I don't know if it's ever going to change. We'll have different tools to solve it, but uh, some of the problems will be the same. Yeah, I have to imagine some of it is going to be tuning into the right channels. We're already seeing so many outlets and avenues for communication, mm -hmm. determining what course or direction is part of today's challenge, let alone what we might see in 15 years from now. Yeah, he didn't have LinkedIn either, so. <laughs> Julia, crystal ball into 2030. I mean, I, I have to agree. It's, it's difficult to see that far into the future. But I think, um, you know, our, from, from our perspective, really the important thing is to continue listening to the alumni, to the current students, and trying to deliver on their expectations. I think this is why we all get up in the morning and, and try to do our best. So I don't have a brilliant answer to this question because, like I said, I've never been one to, to project that far out because I think that probably the ideas wouldn't be very aligned with reality, but I think just to, to keep on trying to do our best. Well, representing technology, uh, certainly 15 years is a very, very long time cycle to exactly. uh, pro project uh, what version of what product uh, Blackboard might have. Exactly. So I think uh, on the topic of technology, definitely I agree with Jeff on big data. Um, I also think uh, Predictive analytics is something that you know will be much more ingrained in the work that we do. Um, gaining a deeper understanding of our alums and our students and what you know really matters to them. Um, on the sort of campus partnership side, I would love to see that every single alumni relations group in this room has a partnership and a deep and substantive partnership with their career center. Um, some of the informal conversations that I've had just over the past few days you know, lead me to believe that that may not be as prevalent as it, it should be. So on behalf of the career services profession, I'm taking your message back <laughs> to my tribe. <laughs> um, and I encourage you to reach out to them uh, as well because I think you know, we're so intertwined, the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, James will tee up, but I would like to uh, frame this up um, since 15 years is a difficult time horizon yeah, to, yeah. To, to guess and measure. Um, <clears throat> I think most of us are beginning to see the um, redefinition of constituent relationship management and outreach. Um, constituents typically you know, have been in that alumni or development area. Um, we're seeing far more interest um, going back into a student recruitment um, student life experience um, would have to imagine that some components of that data in a big data play would likely have um, an impact on what 2030 might look like. So uh, with, with that being a little bit of context, are, are there some thoughts there that uh, how UCLA or UCL, excuse me, or you, UCLA. Um, yes, UCLA, <laughs> <laughs> where's, where's Kristen, yeah, uh, how UCLA is thinking about this? I mean, I, I agree to a large extent there'll be a lot of the same problems. Um, I think we are increasingly, the funding is going to, in the UK, be more and more withdrawn. Um, so we're going we're gonna to branch out, we already are, to a lot of non-alumni supporters um, looking for their expertise, again, their financial help. Um, and it's going to drive a lot of our programs. We're going to be, it's even more focused on parents, students, connections, networks. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of alumni relations league table um, come 15 years time. Um, you know, there's already a big emphasis on student experience. So, you know, as students, when they're choosing a place, they think, well, how, how do they look after me once I've left? You know, and how does that rank, truly rank? Um, which could be quite scary on occasion, but <laughs> might be a reality. Um, but it's just going to get even more driven by strategy and recruitment focus and, you know, really making the very most. I'd like to think all the UK alumni teams would, you know, triple in size, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. <laughs> Carol? Well, I can only agree, but I also think man maintaining relations with your alum through their life, that will be important, even with all the technology, big data, whatever you're using, the relationship is what counts. And indeed, I agree, you should work together with career services, recruitment, student services, because uh, I'm very big of uh, student life cycle. I think it's very important to engage them the moment they come in so they don't uh, feel lost in the university or campuses 
where they start, and you, you should help them through their life. And that's the relationship you build. Yeah, so the, the more things change, the more they remain the same to some extent. Yeah. Years ago, um, you know, by 2030, uh, my, my own generation, we talked about generations this morning, Generation X, we will have, our, we will have our moment in the sun because Generation Y and Z, or for some of you Z, will have uh, exterminated us and taken over. And they'll be running, they will be running the show and will be cynically sat back somewhere in a locked room, unable to do anything about it. Uh, they'll be They'll be online, because we've seen that they're, they're online. Uh, there'll also be a, a much larger transparency of that data, that continuum of data, which should make it a lot easier. I mean, you're going to go out and do all these amazing things we've talked about today, so it should be a utopia, really. Um, so you, you'll have that, but what you also have, and we're seeing it now, and not quite sure where it'll go, you know, technology talking to each other, connecting, a lot of it will be around different technologies connecting, and of course the unknown technology that if I knew I would do and be a billionaire. But then there's the, the evolution of, of education, and whether it's driven by fees, I mean here in the UK or in the US and other countries might have that, and, and funding, uh, it's, it's driven by the internet and online learning and movies. <coughs> Uh, and how people will engage with institutions is changing already. And where it's going to be in 15 years, who knows? But there's going to be this blurred line between who is a student, who is an alumni, who, who is a customer. You know, I do, I do six months learning here on campus and then continue to do the rest of my degree in a job remotely. I top it up over five years. It will change. And so how do you describe alumni and how you, you know, we have students, we have alumni, uh, I think will just become a more fluid thing. That, that can be a good thing. It's the same opportunity stroke challenge, isn't it? Uh, but I think you know, their experience of how they engage with institutions or, or just with educational providers, because I think uh, that's, that's where we're heading, um, will be very, very different. And it will mean how you work with them and what you provide to them will also evolve as well. Very good. And Charles and I are certainly aligned as being uh, in the technology space and, and wanting to get as much information around long-term vision and direction and strategy because we have to put forward plans and roadmaps to try to align uh, data offerings or product offerings related to that. Um, before we close, uh, again, I want to harness the uh, sort of intellectual horsepower here in the room on this topic. And if there is a uh, sharing that someone wants to offer on how they see dynamic change occurring um, in 2030. Is there a uh, uh, quick update or thought on that? Or is everyone thirsty and ready? <laughs> everyone would like wine now. <laughs> Robert has the mic now. That could, uh... well, with that, then we'll be mindful of everyone's time. I want to uh, thank my, uh, my colleagues here on the panel today for your uh, expert opinions. Thank you for going back over.